Good evening, everyone, uh, and good day to those of you who, <laughs> who are living where it isn't yet evening. My name is Kate Lannan, and I work with the Secretariat for the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. We would all like to welcome you to this side event, to the uh, meeting of the COP to the Basel, Rotterdam, and Stockholm Conventions. Um, to this particular side event in which we have a number in which we share an interest with the World Health Organization. We're very pleased to be co-hosting this event with WHO's Department of Health Promotion and with WHO's Department of Environment, Climate Change and Health. And of course, the topic of tonight's discussion uh, is a, a very interesting one to us and we hope it will be to you as well. The topic is tobacco product waste, a threat to the environment. Now, of course, um, most of us know, perhaps even all of us, that tobacco uh, 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 takes a very heavy health toll on the world globally and on many people around the world. But what perhaps is lesser known, that tobacco also takes a very heavy environmental toll on the world. Um, this year's theme for the World No Tobacco Day event, which is hosted annually by WHO, is tobacco, a threat to the environment. Now, Globally, more than 6 trillion cigarettes are produced annually, and most people don't realize the enormous environmental footprint that is left not just by the tobacco butts themselves or the litter, but through the cultivation, the production, the distribution, the consumption, and the waste of such products. Um, so without uh, further ado, let's start with our first speaker. We're very pleased to welcome uh, tonight, tonight for opening remarks. Uh, Dr. Maria Nera. She is the Director of the Environmental and Public Health Department at WHO um, and has held uh, several senior positions in the WHO. She was previously the Vice Minister of Health and the President of the Spanish Food Safety Agency. Uh, in addition, Dr. Nera has been awarded the Médaille de l'Ordre National du Mérite by the Government of France and she's a member of the Academy of Medicine Asturias, Spain. Uh, in 2019, Dr. Nero was nominated as one of the world's most influential people in climate policy, and her work has been recognized in raising awareness on health, climate, and air pollution globally. So we're very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Nera tonight to provide some opening remarks. Over to you, Dr. Nera. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, good uh, evening for those who might be connected and uh, listening to us from other places around the world. What a pleasure to be with you, particularly because I'm very familiar with the, uh, the conventions we are discussing here today, because as the environmental health branch of WHO, we attend very much at those uh, conventions, trying always to promote this uh, public health, the uh, different public health causes. Today we have a very special one. Here we are confronted with uh, what is already a huge public health uh, challenge, tobacco consumption. So we, we know the millions of people that they are losing their life every year because uh, smoking, and in addition to that, as if we needed more arguments to stop uh, smoking, we have now this uh, very uh, strong, very important report telling us what tobacco represents for our environment as well. So let me just to give a, 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 a very general frame of why WHO is so much concerned, and, and in particular as well, our Department on Environment, Climate Change and Health. Every year, every year, according to the estimates of WHO, environmental risk factors represent more than 25% of the global burden of diseases. In other words, exposure to environmental risk factors represent 13 million deaths every year that we could avoid it if we reduce those environmental risk factors. Those environmental risk factors are from exposure to, to lack of, say, water, lack of sanitation, certain chemicals that the conventions will know very well, uh, air pollution and, 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 and others, radiation and others. And of course, it will be aggravated, exacerbated by uh, climate change. So what we are trying to do is to reduce all of those environmental risk factors, to protect people's health, to reduce this uh, horrible uh, impact on, on, on and, and deaths every year. And now here we are, tobacco 
that not only was already uh, taking the, 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 the quality of life of many millions around the world, taking the life of many people, costing fortunes to our health systems and the quality of life of our people, that now they are contributing as well to this damage on our environment. And so I think with all of those arguments, with those 84 millions of tons of CO2 that because of the tobacco uh, consumption we are putting in our environment that uh, definitely we don't need it. We are trying to reduce the causes of climate change because we know what that represents for health and here we are with the tobacco adding to that. Obviously, in addition, you will need some deforestation, you need low, uh, uh, land, you need uh, to use water resources, you need to use soil, and, and this will result on a pollution of our beaches, of our soil, of our water, of our oceans, where we will find all of these horrible uh, cigarette butts, plus the microplastics, plus all the toxins that the tobacco will leave us as a fantastic legacy. So my call to all of you is that um, if we needed another argument, here it is, the environmental one. We need to join our forces, the tobacco, the anti-tobacco communities, the public health communities, the environmentalists, and try to to give um, the, 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 the right uh, reasons to, to our citizens to, to stop smoking, to our governments to be very sensitive to that and then to, to implement this framework convention on tobacco. And uh, obviously all of that in the name of the public health for all of those good reasons that I think we have uh, discussed with here today. Kate, I will stop here because I'm sure that there will be a very interesting discussion, but my my passion for joining these forces with the environmental uh, groups that are meeting today in Geneva and um, hopefully that this will result on a, making life very difficult for, for, for the tobacco companies and uh, dissuading as many people as possible for that tobacco is good. So go for it and thank you very much. Over to you, Kate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nera, for those opening remarks and for setting the stage so well for us to drill down on some of the issues that you've mentioned. So to kick off the presentations tonight, we have with us uh, Kelvin Cow, Mr. Kelvin Cow, who is a colleague of mine uh, at the FCTC Secretariat. Um, Kelvin is a program manager who also is in charge of the comms team with us at the Secretariat. So please, Kelvin, maybe you can help sort of just set the stage by sketching out a bit uh, the, the activities of the WHO FCTC Secretariat. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, so before we start, uh, we would like to just play a short video that the Convention Secretariat has produced um, in honor of this year's World No Tobacco Day theme. So I invite Anna to please share the short video and then I'll give a very brief overview of the convention. Think tobacco is only bad for smokers? Think again. Right now, whether you're a smoker or not, tobacco is impacting your health and the future of our planet. From seed to stub to decay, there's far more to tobacco than you think. Every year, six trillion cigarettes are sold to 1.1 billion smokers. This means that every year, over 200,000 hectares of forests are flattened to grow and cure tobacco leaves. That's equivalent to 494,000 football fields. For every 15 boxes of cigarettes sold, one tree is chopped down. Cigarette production contributes towards global warming with almost 84 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent emissions annually. This is nearly as much as some countries' entire annual emissions. Cigarette production also causes 22 billion tons of water depletion, which is equivalent to more than two and a half times the annual water supply to the entire population of the United Kingdom. Using up all this water disrupts natural water cycles. Use of growth regulating chemicals, fertilizers, and pesticides pollute nearby waterways and underground water. 4.5 trillion cigarette butts are discarded every year. That's 1.69 billion pounds of toxic trash, weighing the same as 177,000 African elephants. Cigarette butts take years to decompose, releasing microplastics, 
over 7,000 chemicals and up to 50 cancer-causing toxins into our water, our land, our environment. Tobacco doesn't just affect smokers, it affects us all. The tobacco industry will greenwash these statistics, trying to blow smoke in our faces. But this is where the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control comes in, particularly its Article 18, sounding a call to protect people's health and the environment. Now that you know the truth about tobacco, what will you do about it? All right, so Anna, would you please put up the slides? So I'm just going to give a very brief overview of the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. It's been a pleasure being here this week um, with the BRS COPS um, to talk to um, the delegates about this convention. Um, next slide, please, Anna. So this convention is a historic, legally binding and evidence-based global public health treaty that actually came into force in 2005. So we are 17 years old. And uh, it was developed in response to the globalization of the tobacco epidemic. We realized that you know, um, it's not just a health issue, as Kate alluded earlier. Um, it cuts across uh, such uh, big areas as economics, trade, um, cross-border uh, finance, um, environment, obviously. And the world needed to just come together to see how we can reduce tobacco use worldwide, given the burden that it costs to human lives, but also economically. Um, this was a very novel approach in global health governance. Um, it's, a, it's a treaty, uh, and nowadays we, we hear that more and more treaties have, have, have been um, proposed, um, including the one for plastics and a possible uh, pandemic preparedness treaty from WHO. This convention has had an impact in helping reduce tobacco use in many countries and globally, and it is recognized as an accelerator for the sustainable development goals in target 3.A. Next slide, please. We have 182 parties. Uh, we cover almost 90% of the world's population and is one of the most widely embraced United Nations treaties um, we have to date. Next slide, please. The convention contains measures um, that help to reduce the demand of tobacco, and I've listed some of them here, which I will not read, but you may be familiar with such uh, measures such as um, protection from exposure to tobacco smoke. So if you see smoking bans in indoor public places, um, you see also um, uh, health, graphic health warnings on tobacco packages, um, raising of tobacco taxes, which is a very, very powerful measure to reduce demand, um, and also um, banning tobacco advertising promotion and sponsorship. So a lot of things that you think we were used to 20, 30 years ago, now with a convention in place and countries committed to making a difference to reduce tobacco use, you'll see more and more of these policies being enacted to protect people's health. Next slide, please. The convention also has um, some measures to reduce supply of tobacco. And there are two in particular that are relevant to our theme today. Article 17 in the convention talks about provision of support for economically viable alternative activities for tobacco farmers, um, encouraging them to switch to growing other crops that are more sustainable than tobacco. There's also Article 18 in the convention that talks about protecting the environment and the health of persons um, when it comes to tobacco cultivation and manufacturing. Next slide, please. One very interesting article in the convention is Article 5.3. Now, the tobacco industry is unlike any other industry that we know of. Um, its its uh, interests are in direct um, contradiction to the uh, ideals of public health, uh, and there is an irreconcilable difference in uh, conflict of interest between the industry and, 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 and the aspiring um, goals of public health. So Article 5.3 is there to help parties to protect their public health policies with respect to tobacco control and to make sure that the um, these policies are protected from all commercial and vested interests of the tobacco industry at all costs. And there's one particular recommendation there I want to highlight, which is relevant to our discussion today. It's about denormalizing the industry and um, watching them as they try to promote themselves as being um, socially responsible, and you hear a lot about that, or what we call corporate social responsibility later from other speakers, and how we can deal with the industry um, when it comes to this uh, fact. Next slide, please. So the Convention Secretariat, we are hosted at the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva. Uh, we are 28 strong, um, representing many uh, nationalities. And our work, like the BRS Secretariat, is to service the parties, is to help our parties to fully implement the Convention um, to the best of their abilities. 
Next slide, please. Um, here I've shared a link to our website and a page where we can see a lot of resources that are re relevant to this issue of tobacco environment. I welcome you to go and visit that page and you'll you'll get to see um, a lot of uh, campaign assets that we've developed um, and, um, and, uh, and things that you can use in your respective um, jurisdictions. And that's it. Uh, I'll just leave our contact details next slide uh, for you. And I look forward to the discussion um, that we're going to have today. And thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Kelvin, uh, for that overview of the work that we do uh, in the, the uh, Convention Secretariat. And next up, we have with us, we're very pleased to have with us tonight, Dr. Uh, Nick Vulvoulis. Uh, Nick is a professor of environmental technology at Imperial College London, where he's also a deputy director of the Center for Environmental Policy. Uh, he's known as an international expert in environmental management, particularly where science and engineering interface with public policy. And tonight he's going to share with us some thoughts uh, on tobacco's global environmental footprint. Take it away, please, Nick. Most of the, the data you have heard so far in the video in the presentation earlier have come from our study. So this is a, a, a work we have done at Imperial on, est on estimating the um, global environmental footprint of the whole tobacco industry. Um, the scale of the damage caused by tobacco is, is uh, to the natural environment and our resources has been largely unknown, although we suspected that it's significant. Some tobacco companies produce um, sustainability reports and life cycle assessments, but uh, the assumptions and methodologies are, are not uh, very transparent. And actually what is reported is, 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 is not the full uh, impact of, of the whole supply chain. And most of these assessments are limited to manufacturing processes and producers' immediate supply chain and leave out things like um, uh, tobacco growing, the curing and distribution, um, uh, and, and the end steps of disposing and, and uh, um, the, the end of life of, of, uh, of uh, cigarette uh, butts and, and, and cigarettes themselves. Um, uh, you can see from tobacco cultivation, tobacco curing, primary processing, uh, the manufacturing of cigarettes, uh, cigarette distribution, and the final smoking use and final disposal. Tobacco industry supply chain is uh, both global and extensive. To understand um, uh, the environmental impacts of cigarette smoking, we've done this work, which has been published in uh, the American Journal of Environmental Science and Technology, uh, covering the life cycle impacts of, uh, as I said, the whole uh, global supply chain on an annual basis. Um, we, to assess the environmental impacts of, of uh, global tobacco production, we used the life cycle assessment and material flow analysis, uh, both uh, internationally recognized tools for um, evaluating the environmental impacts of complex products and processes. We used available uh, data from the literature uh, to, as inputs for the models, and also we have some transparent and open assumptions, you can see them in terms of when the data wasn't available. Uh, here you can see the conceptual model of the study for, for which in every stage of the process, we look at what inputs are, are, are uh, in the process and what comes out as waste or as emissions uh, at every stage. And of course, uh, the, the, the red ones are some things that we have had to exclude. So even, even our work underestimates the impact of, of the tobacco industry. Um, the results here you can see in terms of uh, total annual annual input waste and emission flows across the supply chain. The numbers are too small, but at least you can see the, how we have estimated the inputs and emissions at every stage of the of uh, the supply chain, focusing on one ton of tobacco and then extrapolating it for the whole for the whole global tobacco production. So uh, this is kind of how uh, life cycle assessment works. You get uh, a standardized impact uh, results in terms of impact categories. So you can evaluate every part of the process in terms of climate change, in terms of terrestrial acidification, marine eutrophication, human toxicity, uh, urban land occupation, and so on, water depletion, metal depletion. So the amount of resources required are used are depleted through the, the whole supply chain and also emissions from, from the process uh, the whole supply chain them, them itself across these stages. And you can add them at the end as a, as a total. So for uh, um, the 6 trillion cigarette sticks that are produced annually, um, you can see that 32.4 million tons of green tobacco leaf are cultivated. Uh, this happens across 125 countries. 
the production um, leads uh, to uh, 6.4 8 million tons of dry tobacco, which is then manufactured into cigarettes in, uh, across 500 uh, factories across the world. Um, you can see the water uh, requirements, uh, land and, and energy and also materials uh, that are required as inputs, and also the solid waste, uh, aggregated solid waste, uh, total emissions, carbon emissions and wastewater. So, in terms of carbon emissions, uh, 84 million tons of uh, CO2 equivalents uh, are the, the emissions from the total supply of, um, of, of the, the total global tobacco impact, equivalent of emissions of entire countries like Peru or Israel. Um, water depletion, uh, it's just, uh, tobacco requires a lot of water in, in its cultivation and its curing, so about 22 billion tons of water. Uh, again, uh, comparable to, to what um, uh, municipal supply of, of the, the UK. And 21 million uh, tons of equivalent fossil fuel depleted. Um, this, is, this is, again, equivalent to the total primary energy consumption of a country like New Zealand or Hungary. Uh, so you can see that, that when you add it all up, it's, it's a very significant um, a contribution to um, both in terms of resources and emissions. Um, actually, fi um, the tobacco um, competes with with other resources. With uh, so for for land, 5.3 million hectares of fertile land are, are needed are used to produce uh, tobacco. This is land that otherwise could feed uh, up to 20 million people. So if you look at um, the um, just the um, climate change emissions, the, the carbon emissions from uh, the whole supply chain. You can see here that most of it actually comes from tobacco farming and tobacco curing, uh, the two areas. And this is normally the ones that are not covered by the by the by the reports by the industry, which uh, are normally left outside the supply chain. So most of it actually gets underreported. The same thing you can see here. This is the categories I've just described in the life cycle assessment. I'm not sure if you can see the, the, the words, but um, it's the different impact categories. And you can see here that the dominant colors are red and orange, which is, again, the impacts from farming and from uh, curing, which is, again, what, what is most often left out of the reports, um, uh, the sustainability reports from uh, the tobacco companies, because obviously they're focusing more on the manufacturing and the distribution. Um, the tobacco competes, as I said, with essential commodities, you know, for resources and places significant pressures on the health of, uh, of, of the planet, but also are the, its most vulnerable inhabitants. Almost 90 percent of tobacco production takes place in developing countries. Uh, actually, the top 10 tobacco producing countries are developing and four of them are actually low income food deficit countries. So you know, they, they, they struggle for food. And that means that land is used for tobacco instead of, you know, for producing food for, for their peoples. Um, the environmental burden uh, falls, as you can see, in, in, in most, the most vulnerable places on the planet where people um, uh, suffer the consequences of tobacco, of growing tobacco. But obviously the, 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 the profits come with the multinationals in the developed and the higher income countries part of the world. So there is a great injustice in terms of how, let's say, people that smoke in the developed world actually have the impacts in, in the poorer um, countries, which end up producing most of the, the cigarettes. Um, there is there is the argument that, that that you know when you challenge what is the real benefit of tobacco smoking, when, what's the real benefit in terms of of uh, of this activity? You know, you get the idea that that oh, you know, there is income for people in 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 poor economies that they are producing tobacco and they're making money out of it. But that's really a, a, a bit of a myth. Tobacco cultivation requires substantial inputs, so uh, it takes a lot of uh, effort and, and with which doesn't account in the price that um, companies are paying for it. Fertilizers a lot of chemicals in the process. Of course, um, labor and uh, often children are used uh, in the production. Um, and, and there's a lot of substantial toxicity in the soil, the land and the water ecosystems where it's produced. Other crops require fewer inputs. And that's interesting because you can actually see that there's a bit of a myth and, a, a, and a propaganda that, that tobacco is, 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 a, is a, a cash crop. Uh, in Zimbabwe, for example, a hectare of land could produce 19 times more potatoes than, than the 1, 1, 1 to 1.2 tons of tobacco that's cultivated there uh, currently. 
Uh, again, a myth that it gives us a lot of income. An average tobacco farmer in Kenya will take about £120 a dollars per year after covering all their expenses. And of course, that doesn't include the cost of the labor. So it doesn't really allow much income to even address the, the, the food needs or put enough on the table. Um, now, when you look at it at, at a personal, at an individual level, in, in terms of uh, a typical cigarette, let's say, that, that somebody smokes, uh, has shown to have, let's say, a water footprint of, of about 3.7 liters, a climate change contribution of about 14 grams of CO2, and a fossil fuel depletion of 3.5 grams of oil. It doesn't sound significant, but actually, if you consider that, let's say, an adult who smokes for 20, 20 cigarettes a day for 50 years, which is, I guess, a typical profile of of, of, of somebody who is a, a moderate smoker, you can see that these adapt to significant values. Okay, so so it's uh, it's interesting to see that even at although the the global production is the one that demonstrates the significance, even at the personal at the individual level, when you actually see this, uh, um, uh, the impacts are are comparable to to some of uh, other activities. Now, I um, you have to remember that we live at the times where we are facing global challenges and constraints in terms of resource depletion, wasteful and harmful production and consumption, and the emerging impacts of climate change. So uh, I'm sure you know that, that, that even uh, governments have started recognizing that we are facing a climate and an environment emergency. The UK and the EU recognized in 2019. And uh, there is a wider acceptance that we need to reduce our carbon emissions and address some of the overconsumption of the planet's limited resources. So while we're facing people, you know, asking to asking people to reduce their travel, you know, change their diets, it, it makes no sense to 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 let people to uh, smoke when there is really no benefit uh, other than the profits to multinationals from 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 the impacts of 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 cigarette smoking. Um, now, saying that, you know, I, I thought I'll use this quote because it's not always fair to refer to individuals. You know, this is not just about individuals uh, having the decision to smoke less or being under pressure to cut smoking. Um, tobacco, uh, this is a statement for, that I quite like, just tobacco, alcohol misuse and obesity, all of these uh, remain intractable problems because of, of our economic system, because of re free ranging corporations using, you know, promotion, ambiguous distribution, uh, advertising, um, seductive price strategies to encourage unhealthy consumption and, they do, and make it very difficult for people to, to stop smoking or make it very easy for them to get addicted to these sort of practices. Um, these are all maladies that governments try to prevent, more, mainly by targeting consumers, by targeting individuals. But really, a, a lot of the, this comes with um, behaviors, cultures, and institutions, and it's driven by and supported by corporate and government practices. So that's something again we need to remember when we're trying to reduce and change people's habits. Uh, I guess to close. Um, Reducing tobacco consumption is, is, is significant at the times of, of climate emergency. It needs to be identified as a key lever, uh, lever for achieving the sustainable development goals, particularly things like the SDG 12, which is responsible for production and consumption, SDG 13, which is about climate action, and uh, even 14 and 15, which is about water and land. Um, it is, it is, I think, fascinating that while despite their enormous profitability, the industry bears a few of the health and environmental costs caused by its products. Uh, and uh, it's, I think we can all conclude, I hope you will agree with me, it's my conclusion that it's unacceptable that the industry can continue to make billions in profits while washing its hands in, 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 in greenwashing or not admitting or not doing not paying the costs of the distracting environmental impacts its products uh, um, deliver. So at that point, I'd like to thank also Maria and uh, Zafiridu and Professor uh, Nick Hopkinson from Imperial, who were part of the team that delivered the study. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much for that uh, that uh, wonderful presentation, really drawing the curtain back on a lot of very stark and startling figures uh, about the impact that tobacco has on the environment uh, throughout its whole uh, production chain. Um, next, we'd like to, to focus on, on maybe how um, how responsibility uh, should be should be taken uh, for these sorts of effects. 
Um, we have with us, we're very pleased to have with us tonight, uh, Dr. Tom Novotny, who is beaming into us from uh, sunny San Diego, or I hope it's sunny today. Um, Tom is actually a recipient of a, of a 2022 WHO um, World No Tobacco Day Award, which is a very prestigious award uh, given out uh, every year. Uh, he is a professor emeritus of epidemiology and biostatistics at San Diego State University, where he's had, of course, a, a long and illustrious career. Uh, importantly, in 2010, he founded the Cigarette Butt Pollution Project, uh, which is a research, educational, and advocacy nonprofit organization that addresses tobacco's impact on the environment. And tonight, he will speak to us on, uh, like I said, taking economic responsibility for the human and environmental costs of tobacco product waste, and will outline for us a, a case study of something really interesting that's been taking place in San Francisco. So please, Tom, would you like to take the floor? Thank you very much. And I also want to thank you for inviting me and also for this wonderful award that I received in the mail. <laughs> and I very much appreciate the recognition that that that, uh, that was uh, provided to me for uh, the work that we've done on tobacco and the environment. So uh, again, let me start by getting my slides up here. Um, and I think we're good. Today, I want to talk a bit about the economic uh, ramifications of the human and environmental costs of tobacco product waste and what may be able to be done about them. Uh, it was a great presentation from Nick and the study that they've done at Imperial Tom, College. Yes. Tom, I would just interrupt to say that we can't actually see your slides right now. I know we had a few ah. technical glitches earlier, so we're not able to see them right now, unfortunately. Well, let me get them up. Let me try again. Ah, yes, there they are. All thank right. you very much. One more button I had to push. Sorry. Uh, at any rate, I, again, I want to thank Nick for that wonderful presentation. Uh, and uh, to emphasize that there are economic costs all along this life cycle uh, insult to the environment that he described. Uh, the land and water issues, air, land and water utilization, there are costs to all of these things. We're going to be focusing more on the right side of this diagram where the impacts on the environment from use of tobacco products as well as the disposal of them as tobacco product waste and what that might actually do, not just to the costs of cleanup and prevention of this kind of, uh, of problem, but also what the ecological uh, impacts may be. Uh, Nick mentioned quite a few of these in terms of the production cycle, but there are some also that we should consider uh, as ecotoxicity uh, in the post-consumption uh, uh, period. Uh, so we have, you know, a pretty visible public nuisance in tobacco product waste. We can see it on the streets wherever we go in any kind of urban environment, oftentimes also the natural environments such as the beaches, uh, parks, uh, and other places where people expect to see a pristine environment. Uh, there are costs, of course, to cleanups. Uh, it's not just a matter of volunteers going out and picking up cigarette butts off the beaches, which is done every year as part of the International Coastal Cleanup, where we find that you know the single most picked up item is tobacco product waste. This degrades our natural and urban environments, not just the sort of quality of the natural environment, but also the sort of uh, disparities uh, that appear in terms of high levels of tobacco use that are often in times in communities that are underserved in many other ways as well. And that there are some secondary impacts, as uh, we'll describe a little bit later. Uh, much of this related to the potential for leaching out of toxic carcinogenic chemicals, which has been mentioned several times, including the plastics, which is now becoming much more uh, visible and, and measurable, actually, even in the human uh, tissue, as well as uh, animals and uh, in, in, uh, in natural environments. So that there may be human health costs down the line that we haven't yet um, been able to get a good picture of. So uh, what we do know, though, are there are laboratory and field studies that really demonstrate what the toxicity of tobacco product waste are. And this has been mentioned several times today, whether it's mycobacteria or to uh, more uh, advanced uh, organisms such as fish. Much of this has been done in laboratory studies. We also know that uh, pets and humans through accidental consumption have uh, suffered from the toxicity of tobacco product waste. And we know about all these chemicals that uh, Maria mentioned earlier, nicotine, uh, uh, tobacco-specific nitrosamines, metals, etc. 
And that these have been actually found in natural environments. We've been doing some studies here in natural reserves in California. We've been able to identify the sediment and the water and the soils surrounding these that have been uh, directly impacted by specific tobacco chemicals, uh, mostly related to the urban runoff that uh, affects some of these natural areas. What we do also now know is that there's a potential for bioaccumulation and bioamplification possibly in the food chain from low levels of organisms that are consumed by higher levels of organisms and maybe even and get into the uh, 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 human food supply at some point down the line. So these all have some impacts on the quality of life, perhaps even tourism uh, and also on uh, urban uh, health. So what we can see is that there are some potential pathways of uh, tobacco product waste to human health risks that start with uh, disposal of these inappropriate disposal of uh, tobacco product waste, cigarette filters, and other kinds of tobacco product waste, including electronic cigarettes, that may get through various uh, mechanisms to affect human health as it uh, comes up the food chain, especially. What I want to emphasize, though, is that looking at the economic side of uh, tobacco product waste has, uh, I think, some, un some unrealized potential value. Uh, we're working on this with a, a current study that we've been doing with uh, the California Department of Public Health here. Uh, and uh, I, I hearken back to uh, uh, an experience that I had where I was uh, working with several economists on uh, attributing or uh, estimating the attributable costs due to uh, of medical care due to cigarette smoking back in the early 90s. And we published this in the CDC's weekly newsletter called the MMWR uh, and estimated that there was about $50 billion in healthcare costs at that time uh, directly attributable to cigarette smoking as a result of adjusting out all of the other kind of risk factors and access to medical care and other kinds of things. Eventually, these economic studies led to something called the Master Settlement Agreement in the United States, which was an, a, a, an agreement forced by Congress between the tobacco industry and the U.S. states, which had sued the industry to recover the costs of medical care provided uh, for uh, tobacco-specific diseases. And this uh, set up a restitution fund, essentially, from the tobacco industry that pays out about $10 billion per year for the indefinite future back to the states who were the responsible parties for the provision of this medical care. So that's a pretty interesting lesson to look at and learn from um, because we have now, uh, I think, a good handle on uh, approaching the economic assessment of, of tobacco product waste. So we're doing a study here in California on behalf of the Department of Public Health to look at uh, both the direct and indirect costs or secondary costs of tobacco product waste. So it's a fairly easy, I think, to understand what these costs might involve, starting with prevention. And this means enforcement of laws, uh, the uh, provision of uh, public information campaigns or uh, uh, you know, uh, environmental uh, information campaigns about tobacco product waste to surface abatement, meaning just cleanup costs, uh, whether it's mechanical or voluntary, uh, but then there are system costs where the litter and the waste ends up in storm drains or other kinds of collection uh, systems uh, and also contaminating uh, waste water as well as uh, even drinking water supplies in, uh, in some cases. And also then uh, consideration of disposal costs. Tobacco product waste, as you can tell, is pretty hazardous, especially the e-cigarette waste, which we're now having a, a really good uh, understanding of how it is actually considered a toxic hazardous waste product after uh, use. Uh, and if this is, uh, you know, all kind of consistent with what the laboratory and field studies we are uh, uh, we have mentioned, uh, one thing I think that we don't have a good handle on are these secondary costs where uh, we know that there's cleanup costs, pickup costs, uh, system abatement costs, but then there's these downstream ecotoxicity issues that we haven't yet got a good sense of and whether or not they have impacts on human health and uh, secondary costs as a result of that uh, are yet to be uh, uh, determined. So in terms of these direct costs, it's fairly, fairly straightforward. It's a matter of implementation of litter regulations and prevention programs. Uh, it's a mechanical street sweeping. It's manual or street sweeping and sidewalk cleaning by businesses, for instance, manual area cleanups by voluntary groups in parks and beaches, stormwater systems clean out, uh, which is now being required here in California to reduce the impact of trash into the uh, aquatic biomes uh, and stormwater wastewater treatment in order to protect uh, human health as a result of the 
chemical contamination that ends up downstream from uh, uh, various forms of pollution. So we don't have good data on this, but we have to estimate some of it, but that's uh, something that economists are uh, particularly good at, especially environmental economists. Um, secondary costs, again, these are the unabated tobacco product waste costs. We can't kind of, we can't get a handle on it like we can in just the cleanup costs. We can uh, look at something called a willingness to pay, which is what a stakeholder would pay for the environmental goods or services to be pristine. Uh, this is a, a measure that economists use to measure benefits from other kinds of goods and services provisions. This is challenging in the case of tobacco product waste because there's no market for this waste. There's no, I mean, there's been some attempts at recycling, but these are minuscule compared to the burden of the uh, problem uh, globally. And it's very difficult to assess uh, communities' willingness to pay for these things. So uh, we'll have to look at this more closely, but we do know that there are ecological damages potential, land cleanup costs, impacts on communities, uh, and especially those communities that are most highly affected by tobacco use. So uh, in California, in San Francisco, almost 12 years ago now, uh, the uh, advocates, uh, mostly environmental advocates uh, in, uh, in San Francisco, uh, decided to get a handle on the cost of tobacco product waste, what it cost the city to clean up uh, the ubiquitous, ubiquitous um, uh, burden of tobacco cigarette butts primarily. Uh, and a study was done using uh, litter audits as well as a, a, an assessment of the costs of total litter and the proportion that would be uh, attributable to tobacco product waste. And what the city then was able to come up with was a maximum permissible per pack fee to recover the costs that were estimated for direct cost cleanups of uh, tobacco product waste in, in San Francisco. And this came out to about 22 cents per pack of cigarettes, which then allowed them to assess this litter fee onto a pack of cigarettes at the time. And of course, they were sued by the tobacco industry in their front groups and were able to resist these um, suits because they had a pretty good scientific basis for uh, saying, well, this is what it costs us. And this is a negative external uh, economic, uh, economic externality. And so uh, that was a, a very remarkable uh, moment. It led to uh, a citizen initiative, quote unquote, led by the tobacco and other industries to stop any such fees from being uh, developed again by communities unless they had a two thirds vote of the um, electorate. So they framed this as a tax, even though it was a fee that was meant to, to, to uh, provide program costs, enforcement costs, cleanup costs, as well as informational and administrative costs. But yet it is framed as a tax uh, now uh, with this secondary legislation that made it very difficult for other communities to put it into place. But the interesting thing about it is that since this uh, uh, fee was put into place 12 years ago, it's been increased to $1.05 per pack because of labor costs and inflation uh, without having to go back and ask for a tax increase. So it, you know, as a fee, it didn't have to have this sort of uh, approval as a tax because it was able to be shown by the city tax controller that uh, these costs had increased. It's administered through the environment department, not the health department, but there haven't been any good formal evaluations of what it's done in terms of litter reduction or cap per capita cigarette consumption. We did a second study uh, nationally using the same sort of approach in San Francisco, where we were able to look at 30 uh, large US cities and their costs, based a really very rough estimate of the cost. And you can see here, um, in the means that the range is from about $4 million uh, a year to $58 million a year in New York City. Again, not insubstantial. And when you look at this, this is annual over time. Uh, and so these costs are, first of all, minimized uh, in this estimation process and also uh, something that uh, accumulate over time. So uh, these are important pieces, I think, in our fight against tobacco to really uh, get a handle on the economics. So the current mitigation policies, you know, what we are pretty familiar with are PR campaigns, social media campaigns, but waste cleanups, which do raise the level of attention to the problem. There's banning of outdoor smoking and various elements. Uh, these are not universal, and so they're going to be very area specific. There are anti-litter laws up to five, uh, up to a thousand dollars per event in California is possible, but they're hardly ever enforced. And then there's this effort at take back and recycling, which I don't think has any 
um, future because of the logistics involved in something like this and the fact that this is toxic hazardous waste that has no value. So these things just have not worked. And so what we need to look at are more innovative approaches, things that maybe uh, 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 address the tobacco industry liability. One of those is the economic liability where the tobacco industry must be held responsible for all or part of the cost of collection of these disposal of these product. This could be applied with a fee or some other sort of uh, recovery process, perhaps uh, a litigation. Uh, the physical liability where the manufacturer can be forced to change the product. And here's where I think the most uh, effective upstream intervention may be, which is to ban the sale of filtered cigarettes, especially the plastic filter, because it has no benefit to human health. And it has every uh, bit of the uh, hazards that we've described here in terms of plastics and, and uh, toxic uh, chemical release in the environment. And then there are informative responsibilities where the manufacturer should require should be required to provide information on the hazards of the products, which they have not done. And this is another part of this uh, extended producer responsibility concept. So I'll conclude, conclude here and just say, look, there are costs of tobacco product waste in the environment. It's not just the blight uh, that we notice walking down the streets, but it is really a, a part of our environmental urban degradation. There are costs of the cleanups of this. There are ecotoxicity issues, potential human health issues, and that these costs are not borne by the tobacco industry, but by communities, governments, taxpayers, and voluntary groups as negative e economic externalities. So the tobacco industry must be held accountable for all of these environmental health costs, and they are not stakeholders in the policy development and should not be included in any sort of extended producer responsibility uh, considerations as uh, they go forward. They are the body to be regulated, not to be collaborated with. I'll close there, and I thank you very much. I'll stop sharing my screen, hopefully. Great. Thanks very much, Tom, for that, that very enlightening uh, presentation on on uh, the the real cost of uh, tobacco product waste and who should be made to to bear that cost. Um, next up, we have another uh, very interesting presentation from another uh, World No Tobacco Day award winner in 2016, and that is Ms. Emmanuelle Beguino. Uh, Emmanuelle is the director of the Comité National contre le tabagisme, which is the French National Committee for Tobacco Control. Um, the CNPC, as it's known, uh, is a specialized uh, NGO that is really involved in the prevention of uh, tobacco use and the protection of people uh, regarding damage due to tobacco and the tobacco industry. Um, primarily, the association is particularly involved uh, in respect of WHO FCTC Article 5.3, which Kelvin talked about a few moments ago, on how to protect public policies um, against the interference from the tobacco industry. And the CNTC regularly takes legal action against tobacco manufacturers um, uh, at the origin of uh, major case law. So uh, Emmanuel will discuss tonight, uh, will show us a French case study uh, that talks a little bit about tobacco industry tactics around single use plastic pollution uh, and policies and civil society efforts to counter these activities. So please, Emmanuel, may I give you the microphone? Thank you very much, Kate. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Well, as mentioned, I'm going to present you the uh, SUP policy in French. And briefly to complete your, uh, what you, your presentation, Kate, I would like to insist on the fact that we face really um, in tobacco as an ep industrial epidemic. And that's very important to insist on the damages due to this product for health, but also for environment, for all the other social costs. So um, in order to understand also the sub policy, it is also important to keep in mind the French context. First of all, uh, regarding tobacco control, uh, we face a still a high tobacco prevalence with roughly a third of the adult population which continues to smoke in France. And that's why the comprehensive tobacco control strategy which has been defined aiming at reaching a tobacco-free generation by 2032 
uh, aims at increasing more and more um, the normalization of these products and of this industry. And this now it's possible thanks to the FCTC treaty. Uh, we mentioned that there is a specific article on environment. And uh, because we also dispose of much more many scientific evidences nowadays, and because also uh, thanks to the involvement of a tobacco control organization. So environment is becoming really part of tobacco control activities. And at the same time, we also see that um, policies in charge of environment also include more and more tobacco products in their scope. So that's important to keep in mind but at the same time we have to face a very strong lobby as it was explained and particularly we have to face the results um, of a very comprehensive greenwashing CSR strategy developed by the tobacco manufacturers. Of course they have different objectives first of all to hide reality regarding all the damages for environment to their products the idea is also for them to improve their image and it's also a way for them to gain uh, recognition but above all to access to policymakers because the core for them is to be able to influence uh, possible regulation and to interfere in policies and all the tobacco manufacturers are involved in such a greenwashing strategy. Here on this slide, you have a British American tobacco, but if you visit the website of Japan Tobacco International, that's the same thing, again with Imperial Brands, and again with Philip Morris, and even this tobacco manufacturer promotes nowadays its new tobacco products um, through that way, even if um, probably these new tobacco products are even worse for environment. So the sub-directive which was adopted in France refers to a European uh, directive, that's the sub-directive which was adopted in 2019 and the aim is to reduce, as you know, the impact of plastic in environment. And concerning tobacco products, the idea is to reduce uh, discarded bats by 40% by 2027. And there are different measures. Among these measures, we have, for example, the idea to disseminate information regarding uh, environment, especially plastic and tobacco products. And we disseminate this information through com communication campaign and also through the obligation to oppose nowadays warning on tobacco packs. That's the case in France from July 2021. There are also an obligation to make regularly reports. So that's a kind of evaluation. And what is important is that the principle which has been adopted is the polluters payer principle. And the system adopted to implement this principle is the extending producer responsibility system. That means at a very concrete level that the tobacco industry has to pay for covering the cost of cleaning up bats in the street, also has to contribute to city facilities or to some sector, for example, the Eureka sector, hotel, restaurant, cafe, and also has to financially support research and development on this project. The problem concerning the transposition we have in France is that uh, the extending producer responsibility system has not been adapted in order to include the specificity of the tobacco industry and particularly Article 5.3 of the FCTC Treaty. As you uh, know, this article is a crucial article uh, of this convention because it aims at protecting po uh, public policies from the interference of the tobacco industry. And if we see the system which has been adopted in France, we have uh, uh, nowadays an ecosystem called Alcom, which gathers representatives from the tobacco manufacturers and also from the tobacco retailers. And they are in charge of different missions, which go much beyond what is strictly necessary. And directive regarding Article 5.3 recommend precisely to limit interaction with the tobacco industry to what is strictly necessary. And here, 
you have an eco organization gathering stakeholder from the tobacco industry we, which is in charge of for example communication campaigns which is in the capacity to contract agreements with local authorities and as you can imagine they are going to use this situation um, in their advantage for example concerning communication they will never communicate on their own responsibility because the problem due to plastic in the environment because of filters is just a result of a decision taken by the tobacco industry because it was not at all a decision for health because it doesn't reduce risk for smokers. It's just a marketing tool in order to increase sales and profit for this industry. So they will never communicate on this topic, on their own responsibility. If you visit their website, you will see that they always transfer the responsibility on smokers, on incivic smokers. That's really one on the problem. And the second problem is also that they are in the capacity to communicate through the eco-organism ALCOM. They communicate and they still have quite a good media coverage and even local authorities communicate on the situation. And we see that they are in the capacity to present the, their involvement in the very positive aspect. There are also some other weaknesses regarding the current system. Um, we see that the scope of this SAP policy is really limited. Uh, it is limited to uh, filters used for tobacco products, and it doesn't include uh, e-cigarettes, for example, pots. And it also limited for um, the, the place of disposal because we only have public uh, discarded bats which are concerned, private are not concerned. And last, the coverage of cost is also very limited concern, uh, concerning this policy. We also noted some counterproductive uh, measures, such as the distribution of pocket ashtray. We know that if you distribute pocket ashtray, you will increase the consumption and you will increase wastes and bats. And last but not least, we have very efficient provisions which have not been taken into account because the key solution to reduce the impact of plastic due to tobacco products is to reduce the consumption, to reduce the prevalence. And we have very efficient provision um, to reduce this consumption. For example, the, the extension of tobacco-free places and probably the most efficient um, measure here to reduce plastic would be to ban filters. So if we want to evaluate this policy, for sure, it's, it is really an excellent initiative to consider that the tobacco industry has to pay for all the damages for environment. That's very, that's incredible and we absolutely support this approach. But the problem is that we absolutely need to adapt the extending producer responsibility system to the tobacco industry and to include uh, the protection of um, public policies and not only for health but also for environment regarding this uh, this lobby and we have to adopt a larger approach and particularly to have a governance which excludes this industry in the government is the eco organism and that's why we particularly launch an alert concerning our colleagues in other member states so that they do not transpose the directive with similar weaknesses and we also are requesting the European Commission so that they disseminate an implementing decision um, mentioning the the obligation of different member states in the European Union to respect Article 5.3 in this transposition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emmanuel, for that examination of the, of the uh, issues around the single-use uh, plastic uh, directive and for the uh, experience of France in this regard, pointing out certain weaknesses uh, that certainly the tobacco industry has been able to take advantage of. Um, our next presentation will actually be a video uh, from a colleague from UNEP. So Ms. Kakuko Nagatani Yoshida 
is the Global Coordinator of Chemicals and Pollution Action uh, with the UN Environmental Program. Um, she has led programs and projects on environmental assessment, air pollution, chemicals, and waste management, um, as well as in a number of different areas. So perhaps we could start uh, rolling the video now. Thank you. Greeting from United Nations Environment Program. I'm very happy to be speaking on this occasion of special hybrid side event during the meeting of the Council of Presidents of the Parties to the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Conventions. Smoking kills. I think nobody disputes this statement. But many of us are still unaware about the pollution that tobacco products cause. For example, Cigarette butts are the most common plastic litter found on the cleanups, surpassing food wrappers, plastic bottles and caps, and even plastic grocery bags. Cigarette filters are made of plastic called cellulose acetate, which can break down into microplastics of less than five millimeter in diameter. And also they release chemicals. Filters contain and eventually reaching out some of the 7,000 chemicals contained in a cigarette, many of which are environmentally toxic and at least 50 are known human carcinogen. Those chemicals get released into water and soil. And studies have shown that harmful chemicals such as nicotine, arsenic, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and heavy metals such as lead reach from discarded tobacco product waste and can be acutely toxic to aquatic organisms such as fish. The problem of the cigarettes and tobacco product and pollution starts way before the cigarette butt is tossed in the environment. With 6 trillion cigarettes manufactured annually and about 300 billion packages are made for uh, tobacco products, we have estimates indicating that the plastic waste associated with the tobacco product is equally significant as source of plastic pollution as a plastic water bottle or many other products that more, we are more aware of. To solve this, the discussion of regulation is increasingly focusing around something we call extended producer responsibility, EPR. With almost 400 existing schemes globally across various product types from packaging to used tire to vehicle to electronics, EPR is a known policy tool that has been widely adapted at scale in different contexts. Effective industry EPR will require manufacturers to collect, transport, and dispose in a sound manner discarded product waste. And that will remove the economic cost of the dealing with the waste from the state and local governments. Currently, cleanup and disposal of uh, tobacco-related waste products are cost of the local government and not borne by either producer or user of tobacco product. This is a not sustainable way of uh, situation. According to the OECD, there is evidence that level of waste disposal have decreased and the recycling rate to go up of the waste when you have EPR scheme implemented on the ground. And let us not forget that we all must accept that our cities, households and businesses do generate waste. While we all shall aim to minimize and waste and pollution in our daily life and every steps of the value chain, there always be some volume and type of waste that cannot be recycled and therefore have to be disposed of. So it's essential that all cities, villages and households have access to ways of sound management of waste collection and segregation 
with adequate financing to minimize pollution. After all, we have only one planet to live. This is our home and therefore our responsibility to look after. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those video uh, comments. Uh, next, we will turn to our uh, colleague from WHO, uh, Dr. Kelsten Schotta, um, who is going to uh, give us a presentation on WHO's efforts uh, in this area in light of the 2022 campaign uh, for World No Tobacco Day. Kelston is, uh, works with uh, the WHO Headquarters Department for Health Promotion, uh, where, which provides global scientific, or in which, sorry, she's with the unit that provides global scientific and technical leadership in matters related to capacity building in tobacco control. Please, Kelston, you have the floor. Thanks very much, Kate. And I will try to be a little bit faster because I think we lost some time. And for those who are new to WHO, maybe in our audience, you know us probably mostly from talking about COVID-19 in the recent years. So why is tobacco such a priority for WHO? You've heard in some of the presentations that it's killing 8 million people per year. And I wonder whether people know how to put that into perspective. How many people do you think die each year of all causes? and all ages, including accidents, chronic diseases, old people, children dying from malaria. How many do you think die each year? Does anybody know? So about 57 million people die each year. And I think that really puts this 8 million deaths, premature deaths from tobacco into perspective. And this is why it's such a huge priority for us at WHO. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So um, every year WHO celebrates World No Tobacco Day. We have been celebrating this since 1987. It's already uh, now 35 years. And every year we, so to say, put the spotlight of the problem tobacco control on a different topic because it's so many different aspects. We have uh, health aspects, economic aspects, human rights aspects. And this year, you see in the on the slide here, we decided to focus for the first time on the environmental aspects of tobacco, because it is killing 8 million people lives per year, but it's also destroying our environment. And this is why it's now not only anymore a human problem, but it's an environmental problem. And it's a developmental problem, a human development, a threat to human development as a whole. Next slide, please. So in this uh, few minutes that are left in this presentation, I will present the campaign material that we have been issuing for this uh, World No Tobacco Day. Our main target group always for World No Tobacco Day is the general public. In our day-to-day -day work, we speak a lot with policymakers, with ministries of health, but World No Tobacco Day each year is an opportunity for us to really talk to the general public. And this is why the material that that you will see in the next minute is really very concise information that we hope uh, will be very interesting and new to the general public. Next slide, please. Because our objective is we want to really alert people to the environmental aspects. We think we have been hopefully quite successful in the last 40 years or so to communicate the health impact of tobacco. Many people in many countries are now aware, but we think the environmental aspects will be really something new for tobacco users and hopefully will give them an extra reason to quit. We also want to expose the tobacco industry's greenwashing tactics. You've heard already about this in, in some of the uh, presentations, because this, the tobacco industry, this is our big enemy. It's not the tobacco user. We don't blame the tobacco user, but we want to fight the tobacco industry. And in this campaign, we want to expose how they're putting up a nice picture of being sustainably um, responsible. And in fact, they are not. We also want to encourage policymakers to apply the extended producer responsibility principle that we've heard about so much today. And in fact, also our end goal is that tobacco use will be reduced, that there will be less environmental damage and less 
toxic trash. And we can do this the best by reducing tobacco use. So this is one of our objectives as well. Next slide, please. So um, just in the next few minutes, and I, I will do this quite quickly, uh, I will go through our campaign material. So next slide, please. Um, a big message is about the water supply that is needed. And we go through the whole life cycle of tobacco from growing, manufacturing, distribution, and then to the post-consumer waste. And we have these very abstract numbers of 22 billion tons of water used for tobacco production each year. Next slide, please. Then you've heard already we have more than 1 billion people that use cigarettes um, in the world and they consume about 6 to 7 trillion cigarettes. I had to look up how many zeros a trillion has. It's actually 12 zeros. It's a very, very abstract number. And uh, most of the cigarettes that are used, the, the butts, the toxic trash, full of these plastic butts are discarded into the environment and these are 4.5 trillion each year. Next slide, please. Um, E-cigarette waste is uh, also dangerous. We've heard about that in Nick's presentation because you have mercury in the batteries, you have the nicotine salts, which is a, a toxic um, product. So um, e-cigarette waste is at least as uh, dangerous as the conventional tobacco product waste. Next slide. Um, here's some more information on the land that is cleared annually. So it's not only to grow tobacco that um, forests are cut down, but also wood is needed again to cure, to dry the tobacco leaves. And this is about 200,000 hectares of land and forests that are cleared each year. And on the right side, you see this 22 billion tons of water used. We broke that down per cigarette to make it a little bit more digestible for the individual use. User, user, and it's 3.7 liters that are used to only make one cigarette. Next slide. Um, on the left side, we, we try to put some comparators because the numbers that we try to communicate this year are, are so abstract. So this, for example, this 84 million tons of CO2 emissions from tobacco production, we made a little calculation how many rocket launches that's equivalent to, and it's 280,000 rocket launches. And then uh, again, on the cigarette butt issue, it takes about 10 years for these plastic butts to decompose and 4,000 chemicals, many of them carcinogenic, are leached into the soil each year. Next slide. So, um, yeah, the tax payer usually in the countries is paying for the removal of tobacco product waste. So in our press release that we put out for World No Tobacco Day, we had a calculation for six countries. How much does it cost countries? And Tom has touched on this also and, and described the situation in San Francisco because we wanted to give an idea, for example, for a country like Brazil, or the country where I come from, which you can probably tell from my accent, I come from Germany, it takes about $200 million per year, the country, the taxpayer pays this, to remove tobacco product waste. And this year we really want to get people angry about this. Why should they pay for this? Shouldn't the tobacco industry clean up after themselves? Because it's their profit, it's their product. So we think they should be made responsible for paying these costs. Next slide, please. Uh, we had two webinars that are available online. Next slide um, shows the links, and these um, slides will be made available after the conference, and you can access all of the material and the webinar if you want to go in more detail. And then the last slide has our contacts. If you have any questions, we're happy to be in touch with you. Thanks very much, and I hand it back to Kate. Thank you very much, Kirsten, uh, for explaining this really important campaign that we think is very attention grabbing and has probably really helped shed light for people on a lot of these very important and concerning issues. And now we do have a bit of time uh, that we've reserved for questions. Um, so my first uh, question to those of you left in the room would be, do you have any, are there any people sitting in the room who would have any questions that they would like to answer? 
you simply have to raise your hand if you would if you do have a question and if so we'd ask you to to come and to sit at a microphone and, and ask the question. Um, but in the meantime, we did have a question uh, from one of our online uh, participants. And that question is the following. Which country or city slash state is most advanced in implementation of, EP, of EPR schemes and or product stewardship for tobacco filters? And what lessons can we take to accelerate action on a global scale? Um, now, based on the presentations that were given, perhaps, uh, Tom, we could ask you if you have a few comments you'd like to make on this point. Please, Tom. Yeah, thanks. I, I, first of all, I'd say that very little has been done on this. Uh, France has done a you know, um, fairly substantial amount. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, I be believe that uh, you know they've uh, demonstrated what the, some of the challenges are when the tobacco industry has become involved in these things. Uh, and I believe that uh, uh, Spain has done uh, a bit more on uh, at least uh, the beach cleanups. And uh, beyond that, not much. Now, there were proposals in New Zealand to ban the sale of filtered cigarettes, but that kind of fell by the wayside in their uh, forward thinking uh, strategy. And here in the United States, there have been some individual states that uh, are considering laws against uh, or laws to ban the sale of filters. So all of this is still at the beginning stages of consideration. And I think uh, we'll know Tobacco Day and, this con and the considerations uh, of the uh, FCTC Secretary are, are important in this process. Thanks very much for that. Um, I don't see that anyone else in the room or anyone in the room has, has oh, I do see a question at the back of the room. Please, sir. Oh, thank you. Um, not, uh, it's a question slash comment. Uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm encouraged um, to hear and see what I've seen. I was, I was telling uh, Kelvin earlier on when I saw the poster, I, I, was, I was excited. Uh, cause 2019, I, I was, um, I went to the McCabe center in Australia and I was exposed to what, uh, WHO is, is doing. Um, that was 2019. Uh, I worked for the ministry of justice in my country at the time. And, um, it was quite, uh, uh, you know, intriguing to, to know, uh, the various tricks that the tobacco industry has and the serious effect it has on health. But I'm especially excited. Um, so 2019, I then moved to the environmental agency in my country. And now to see that um, the efforts that WHO and its partners have, have now transcended issues of health and are now uh, discussing the harmful effects of, of tobacco on the environment. Uh, it's it's pretty exciting to me because when I left the Ministry of Justice after the training, I had basically been shut out from all uh, tobacco activities in terms of drafting the bill. We made progress in, in that, drafting the regulations. But because there was no proper relationship between uh, environment and what uh, was being done at the time, it was hard for my current employers to let me participate in that. But now I hear what you're saying. Uh, you talk about the effects on, on climate change. Uh, and I think the brilliant take on the polluter pays principle and, and of course, extended producer responsibility. So for me, this is, this is good news. I, I've enjoyed everything that's been said and I would be open to working with you to find a way of getting um, uh, the Zambia Environmental Management Agency uh, locked in, in in what you are trying to do. And because uh, our Ministry of Health is trying to to push the bill, but there has been serious resistance from the industry. But I know if the environmental sector united with the health sector, we could uh, overcome the the hurdles that we have uh, in our country. So I'm I'm excited um, and I want to thank you for taking the time to to do this. Yeah. 
Thank you very much for that encouraging message uh, from Zambia. We know we WHO is working very closely with the government in Zambia in terms of tobacco control, as uh, has been the, the convention secretariat. So thank you very much for that. And we're, of course, you know, happy to help anyone who out, who out there who needs additional information, who needs access to the studies and the science, etc., to make your cases in your countries. We'd be very happy to support you. So I think we have a few uh, very quick questions we could ask some of our of our presenters. Uh, since this was raised uh, in 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 some of the later presentations, Kirsten, I wonder if we could ask you, um, since cigarette butts are so harmful for the environment, does WHO recommend a filter ban? Yeah, the short answer is yes, we do. Uh, we have heard in one of the presentations that there is no health benefit of having cigarette filters. In fact, there are studies that because of the filters, cig uh, smokers inhale um, stronger and deeper into the lungs and it can increase a certain type of lung cancer, adenocarcinoma. So if anything, there is a negative health effect. And uh, given that there are so many environmental damages of cigarette filters, WHO does recommend as one regulatory measure a ban of filters. Thanks very much. That, that, that's very, uh, very uh, encouraging and, and, and interesting information. Emmanuel, we have also a question that we wonder if you could just sort of elaborate on. And that question would be, what approaches could actually help counter the tobacco industry's greenwashing activities in a particular country? Well, we have different possibilities. First, it's very important to decrypt the CSR strategies and uh, to document, um, for example, how the tobacco industry is always opposed to any efficient measure which could uh, be the key solution, to opposed to any uh, provision which would reduce the consumption, so the number of waste. That's a constant position of the tobacco industry to be opposed to, because it's just very clear the interest of, of the environment is just at the opposite of the interest of the tobacco industry. And that's why we have to decrypt that, to document, to develop multi-sectoral approach in order to de disseminate this uh, information. And we also have to particularly target some uh, stakeholders. I mean, for example, um, economic stakeholders involved in the finance. Uh, we have, for example, in the coming months, a label which should be proposed at the level uh, in France, proposed by the budget ministry, in order to promote uh, sustainable uh, activities. And it's key that the tobacco industry be excluded from this label. That's very important. And that's a message, very clear. We also have to, to see that CSR communication is considered as advertising. And the FCTC is very clear. F advertising um, in favor of tobacco should be banned. So we have to ban this kind of communication. And last but not least, we have just to transpose and, and respect all the disposal regarding the protection of public policies. That's very clear. We have to limit the interaction with this industry. And so through that way, we can make great progress. Quite right. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. We have one final question uh, for uh, my colleague from the Convention Secretariat, Kelvin. This is actually the first time that the WHO FCTC Secretariat is present in the BRS COPS. Um, how important do you see these kinds of partnerships for the future? All right, thanks, Kate. Um, absolutely critical. I think um, the issue here is far bigger and too complex for just one entity or one organization to handle, um, which is why we have the convention. So I think uh, reaching out to colleagues that are outside of our traditional comfort zone, and we normally deal with health um, sector colleagues, so it's refreshing and, and absolutely important for us to reach out both to Dr. Nera's uh, uh, team in WHO, um, the other departments in WHO that have cross-cutting links to the work they're trying to do. I think together we are stronger, as I remember the quote uh, from my head of secretariat in a former webinar that said that uh, we have to do this together. We have to build on each other's um, competencies and strengths and find synergies to ensure that we end up uh, to reach the goal of having a tobacco-free world in the future. Thank you. 
Thanks very much, Kelvin. And I think that that is, is the end of our time for questions. I wonder, Dr. Netta, if we could turn to you for some closing thoughts. Thank you, Kate, and thank you all. It has been really very refreshing and very inspiring. Let me start Let me with start the, 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 the remark about uh, uh, together being a stronger. Being a stronger. Uh, if the uh, natural is engaging on the environmental issues, it's because we know that what's happened to the environment will have a negative or positive on the health of the people. So this is our the, the reason why we are is that we don't want we don't the environment to be damaged. We know that at the end we will be damaging our health as well. So together, definitely, we are stronger. You know, we work very much with environmentalists, with young people, all of these uh, uh, Greta and others who are now demonstrating to, to protect the environment. Well, maybe the fact that they know that the tobacco is uh, contributing to degrade the environment will be yet a, a reason for them not to engage on small tobacco as uh, it look unfortunately that the new generations are doing so here we have another connection where we can make sure that uh, this will be a good reason for people to stop to stop tobacco consumption as nick was as saying nick this is not just a question for the individual this is for the for the corporate the partners the partners you heard the you argument heard the argument the scientific the evidence, evidence, evidence the economic, the economic, the environment, the environment is now, now a social behavior as well as economic recovery, a green recovery after COVID. After COVID. While I was listening While to, I was listening to people, people thinking that, thinking that so much energy, much energy and resources, resources been dedicated, dedicated to fight to something that, something that have never been existed. Exist. And, and then killing, 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 And here we are still, we are still fighting, looking for reasons to, to stop. So let me move now to the action. So, yes, we will create more alliance and making sure that we will make it more and more difficult to the tobacco companies. companies. Yes, yes, we are providing all the right arguments. And, uh, and yet, uh, yes, we will consider, we will consider the government to consider the plan of the tobacco filters. And of course, the final call to all of us is stop tobacco. That's the, 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 the best way to, to make sure that we will not damage our public health and the public health of our societies. Over to you, Kate, and thank you all very, very much for this commitment and engagement and uh, call for action from, from any of the participants. Let's use all the tools we have, including legislation, to go even further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nera, for those inspiring words uh, for us to take off into the future as we as as we leave this event tonight. I'd also like to say thank you very, very much to all of our participants uh, who are here in person and online, and really a very warm thank you to all of our experts and presenters today that really helped us expose this issue um, and, and provi provide us with a way forward. So in closing tonight, and to take, take away with you uh, for the weekend, we would like to show you uh, this year's World No T Tobacco Day video, a very short video, and a very warm thank you and good weekend to everyone. Come and see. I need to show you something. A product that is destroying our planet. To make space for it, millions of trees are cut down. To grow it, chemicals poison the land, the soil, the water. To produce it, the air becomes saturated with toxins. And when it's discarded, our environment is polluted in ways that we can't afford. 
Tobacco costs us more than 8 million lives every year. It also costs us 600 million trees, 200,000 hectares of land, 84 million tons of CO2, 22 billion tons of water. Tobacco is not only poisoning people, it's poisoning our planet.